My name is Mani Bruce Mitchell. I'm an intersex person. I was born in 1953, so that's context. My original training was uh, as an educator and then through teacher, through circum unusual circumstances, I um, ended up in civil defence working in emergency management and did that for 18 years. So developed my skills working in government, local government, um, had wonderful training, including media training before in my very early 40s, really confronting my own story and narrative as an intersex person, um, because it was a story that had been hidden from me as a child. And by then, both my parents had passed. And I realized that it had had a huge impact on myself and, and my family and the community that I grew up in. But as an educator, and I was also now training to be a mental health professional, I thought, I can't change the past, but I absolutely have the skills and knowledge to change the um, future. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad when I made that decision, I didn't realise how hard it would be to change the future. But here we are, all of those years later, um, I, I have had wonderful collaborations with all kinds of people literally all around the world. And we are reaching critical mass. Um, change is coming and that's very exciting. In regards to my own personal story and the circumstances of my birth, I recognise very early on that it's those early moments that are key and pivotal and really set the scene for what's going to happen for everyone. Um, birth parent, the intersex person. And so I, I knew thinking about it that midwives potentially could play a critical role in this change journey. So it's nearly um, 20 years ago that by chance I got to meet a, a, a midwife who was running the training program at Massey University at the time, Dr. Jeannie Duchet, and we worked together in a um, collaborative partnership. And what I realise now, probably introduced for the first time in the world, uh, an, an intersex curriculum. Um, so we can talk about that possibly. So these days I identify as a they them person. The other key feature if you like is I'm also a queer a queer person. I came out as a lesbian in my early 20s um, only because at that point in my story and journey <laughs> If you weren't a cis heterosexual person, that was the only option. We were very language poor in those days. It's been a collaboration with intersex colleagues around the world because, again, we, we've had to find a path through this. Like, it's very easy to see that we'd all been damaged by the, the process, but envisaging what something different would look like with something uh, a completely different process. So I think the key where we've landed all around the world is this notion of bodily autonomy. Um, as, a, as a baby, our bodies don't belong to society or doctors or our parents. And so the frame work that's become universal for thinking about this issue and, and creating how the future could be different it is very much anchored in a human rights notion. So that idea of 
bodily autonomy. And that's why I think, again, it fits beautifully with the sense that I have of what midwifery is about and, and reproductive rights. I think the issue with intersex and, and why it has been so problematic is one, particularly out of a Western lens, we're not comfortable talking about genitals. That was certainly the case in the 1950s, and I would suggest even now, um, you know, it's not something that we have conversations over a coffee table. So that's part of it. But then when you dig under the medical model and it's yet to change, it's very much located in a heteronormative framing. So the idea when a child is born, if there's any question around gender, and it's really interesting because gender and sex very quickly gets mixed up in this. But the idea, and it came from John Money and his colleagues, that you could assign a gender, male or female, and then the idea that that needed to be reinforced by a normative physicality. So that idea of surgery comes out of that thinking. But the piece, and I'm now wearing my hat as a mental health professional, that gets missed, and this is where I think midwives can be involved, is the process of parents being able to engage with the fact that their child is different. And when that child is born, nobody knows what that means. So if we're going to change the paradigm working with a process, now we can step back from that. And I imagine what would happen if in antenatal classes in the course of education, we covered this issue that some children are born as intersex. And it was introduced, nothing dramatic, this, this can happen, it's a percentage of the population, it's no drama, it happens, it's on a spectrum. You know, so that when the baby was born and the, the parents go, oh yeah, I know about that, this is, this is not terrifying, lots of people know about this, not what we expected, but whoa, we can deal with this, how different that would be, yeah. And of course, you know, the first thing that needs to happen is what midwives know all about, that skin-to-skin -skin contact. You know, you have a beautiful baby, the bonding, the connection. Even if it's one of those situations that is potentially life-threatening, nothing needs to happen in that first hour, first couple of hours. So that's why I've had this idea for a long time that midwives potentially really could help be at the forefront of changing this paradigm. And now the interesting thing is it intersects with very contemporary issues around transgender, around transgender men having babies, you know, questioning that the only parents are a woman. So there's a there's an intersection of time where I think we need to re-language, rethink um, how we talk about birth, how we talk about all the issues. So it's, I think, it's a really exciting time. So I'm going to share a story because it, it, it's so much part of my story and what drives me in this role as an educator. So I found out what actually happened at my birth, the only time that my mum and I talked. So I was in my early 20s try, trying to work out who I was and what my story. I had very hazy memories of my, my childhood. So I asked my mum um, what had happened. And she said, well, 
know, I was in Auckland and at that point I didn't know why that was the case. You know, the waters broke, we drove into the hospital, got to an old school um, maternity hospital, the matron met my mum, folded arms and said, you can't have your baby yet, there's no doctors. So he sent mum down to the birthing unit with a young nurse who probably had had no experience. So I was born, the nurse bent down to pick me up and her words were, oh my God, it's a hermaphrodite. This is my mum relaying that. And she started screaming. Now my mum was of that generation that never showed emotions. So suddenly my mum's screaming, she ran out of the room. She was gone about 10 minutes and she came back and she'd been crying, her eyes were red. And she just looked out the window and she said, you know what, dear, it's going to rain. It's a beautiful, fine, sunny day. Let's go and get the washing. We never talked again. You know, and it was only in my process and journey and, and learning to be a mental health professional. I went back and I thought about that. And I thought my mother lived with that trauma until her death. That, that was unresolved for her. So that event turned into um, a horror event for her and of course it impacted our relationship it impacted e everything about how I was brought up and raised so you know what happens in those moments after you were born is with you for the rest of your life literally so I think one of the potential roles is the midwife has a relationship both with the birth parent and whoever is involved in the situation, which is quite different from everybody else who's going to be involved who at the point of involvement are not known. So I think as we move, and, and that seems to be what's happening around the world, where it becomes more of a conversation and more of a, um, a group of people, a team that are working, particularly if it's identified that there, there is an issue, as, as you said, where conversations potentially about surgery or are going on, the role that the midwife can play is being the child's advocate. Okay, everybody, let's slow down a bit and get some more information. And as I say, there are no circumstances where decisions have to be made rapidly. So in enabling the time for those parents to breathe, if that's the process they're in. I mean, some parents go, Okay, not what we expected, but let's deal with this. Whereas other parents are just in complete and utter shock and um, you know, need time to assimilate the, this information. Um, but babies don't die from having genitals that look different. It's, a, it's an issue for society, absolutely. Those are the conversations. And that's where I come back to my introductory point. So a skillful midwife, very comfortably being able to talk about genitals, talk about issues in a non-pathologizing way, how powerful. And also you're then giving the tools to the parents for them to be able to have conversations as a family with their neighbors, if, if they are involved in a church, whatever, in a way that normalizes, gives them the toolbox to just talk about this in a um, non-dramatic way. A lot of the energy is focused at the moment on stopping surgeries, but if we step back and think, okay, what does a really good model of care look like? Then absolutely, it, as we walk forward in a person's journey. So, there will be, first of all, intersex is not one thing. There are over 40 different um, diagnosable variations and they all present differently. So having some familiarity around the, the different variations 
and then when you're interacting with the person being able to have a conversation and understand the particulars of, of the um, person that you're working with so there'll be two categories there'll be the person who has had interventions the associated trauma um, as a child but mostly surgery does happen when, when people babies are quite young my surgery didn't happen until I was eight but I think that's a bit of an outlier particularly today um, but when you work so you'll have those who have had surgery and interventions and those who hadn't but we come back to bodily autonomy so landing in the in the person and their reality where are they and what sort of help are they needing so again in terms of identity within the intersex community for those who identify as cis as heterosexual for those who are queer identified um i know that fertility and exploring the possibility of having children is important to some in the community and often because of the variation you know, are faced with significant obstacles if the person has experienced trauma associated with what happened you know there's often shame and issues around even being a sexual person or engaging with that aspect of self so I was really thinking about this is, as far as I know this is an area that has not yet been well explored if it has I haven't seen any writing up about it so as I think we start doing this work um, in an organized way it's going to be really important to build a toolbox for those people who are working with this community. You know, telling the good stories, identifying what the obstacles are, identifying um, pathways for people that are going to be successful. And then helping people realise where um, pregnancy is simply not going to be possible and then if the person really does want a child you know working with them to explore what the other options are for that to happen there's a very high um, amount of adoption within some of the variations so there's lots of wonderful stories on that side I'm thinking of Kimberly um, Zeisman's wonderful book that was published just at the start of, of COVID. So, you know, that, and again, it would be great if, if people working in this area were aware of the, the books, the personal stories that have been published. So that, you know, have you read Kimberly's book, for example, for parents who are thinking of adopting? <laughs> introducing the area into the curriculum providing opportunities for people to build um, a, a, a toolbox how to work in this area and then you know, the work that you're providing people with a place to go because you know, these situations are not super common so while it's highly likely through the life of a practice you would deal with this issue. You're not going to be dealing with it every week. So having a place where you can go, stay up to date, get good information, I think is um, one of the things I would like to see. And then the opportunity at conferences for people who have been at these experiences, being able to get together and talk. I, I know some of you were recently in Australia and while what we're doing right now is wonderful and I love technology enables us to do this. It is not the same as sitting in a room, you know, and debriefing and, and talking about a case in a within a confidential context and learning from each other. You know, what are the things that work and are good to do? Or, you know, I've had this terrible experience and it was awful. 
but it's profoundly changed me as a person and I've learned so much in being able to share that. You know, which is grow ourselves as professionals and, and you do that by um, sharing stories and learning from each other.